And welcome to another edition of Haunted Hotels. My name is Sam Baltrusis, and I'm an author and journalist. Joining me is my good friend and fellow author, Mike Ricksecker. Hey, welcome to the show, Mike. Thanks so much for having me on, Sam. I really appreciate it. So before we get started, I wanted to plug one of my uh, favorite books that you've written called A Walk in the Shadows. So tell us about the process of creating that book, Mike. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, really, it was a passion project. Uh, I, you know, one of my very first paranormal experiences, like my first significant paranormal experience was with a, uh, a shadow type entity. And it was one in which I had woken up in the middle of the night and there was the thing standing in the corner of my bedroom and it actually physically interacted with me. Uh, We can talk about that at at some point if you like. But as far as, you know, putting the book together, you know, all these experiences that I'd had uh, in my life between that first experience, others that I had uh, while I was young and then becoming a paranormal investigator, experiencing these things. And uh, after I started putting out some of my paranormal literature, people were coming to me about their own uh, shadow stories. And so I started doing presentations on the subject. More and more people were coming forward with their experiences. And so I really started compiling a lot of information about this phenomenon that is is the book. Now in your hands, Sam. And what I really liked about it is, uh, especially because I'm I'm featured in A Walk in the Shadows, uh, is that you captured sort of the um, our conversation. So we, uh, you know, we were filming during, uh, during COVID. So we're talking, we're on, I was on your, on your show and we're having technical problems. Hopefully we won't have technical problems now, (laughs) but we're talking about a specific entity. Uh, and we, when we were talking, it kept cutting in and out, uh, and, and you were able to kind of capture that in print, which is a very difficult thing to do. Yeah, it was uh, quite interesting how, as you would tell the story, and it's you know about these these hat wearing shadow entities that all of a sudden your story would cut out. No, it happened to us on the Edge of the Rabbit Hole show, uh, and so we captured that and. I replayed that when I was interviewing you for the Shadow Dimension docu series. The exact same thing happened again, and yeah, it is difficult to put that into a uh, into a book. It, it's basically a transcript, but uh, you know, I, I so I appreciate the compliment, and it I think it came across pretty well. What exactly was going on there? How you know you felt that anytime you told the story, you would have you know this entity this entity would interfere with that. And, uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's absolutely fascinating what this phenomenon can do. And also the, the video that we shot, uh, was in your docu-series and it, it's nice to see, I, I watched the, the entire docu-series and now it's on Tubi. Uh, so how did, how did that, that uh, process of creating the docu-series? Yeah, that was a really interesting process. So when I first started putting together everything for the docu-series the intention was originally for me to put it up on amazon and as i was getting close to uh being finished with the completion of editing and and everything that goes into to post-production i had found out that uh, amazon had changed their rules about uh, submitting content to there and they basically at that point it put a stop on everything i guess they've opened it up a little bit since then but they had basically stopped any independent documentaries from being submitted to them so i had to find some other means so i started you know looking around for some sort of distribution and uh who I ended up finding was was Film Hub, thanks to uh, my good friend Darcy Weir, uh, who's also a independent filmmaker. And um, in fact, I'm going to be featured in his uh, upcoming documentary on the Men in Black, which is uh, absolutely fascinating. But um, so yeah, he he contact contacted me or connected me with the guys at uh, Film Hub. And we had some back and forth, submitted it to them, and they have a lot of different platforms that they can uh, you know pitch to and get that put up on there and uh, one of those ended up being Tubi which is fantastic so speaking of the, the docu-series um, so I'm in the, the first episode but it's this whole journey of talking to various people about their experiences with shadow people my experience of course was working at the overnight shift at a hotel in Salem Massachusetts and you know so tell us about about like sort of like the the process and the journey that we take by watching the docu-series 
Yeah, absolutely. There were some uh, specific people that I absolutely wanted to get involved with it. You know, Sam, your your story was fascinating. I definitely wanted you to tell that story. Uh, heavily feature uh, demonologist Carl Johnson uh, throughout the series, and uh, he had some significant experiences there at what everybody is calling the Conjuring House, in which he had experienced uh, some rolling black smoke, basically coming out of uh, Andrea Perrin's former bedroom. So, of course, I had to have Andrea on there. And uh, so the first four episodes really feature uh, a, a lot from the Conjuring House. Keith Johnson was also involved with that when we did the walkthrough and uh, Elise Carlson, uh, local historian, uh, also included a, a lot of of uh, material from Johnny Enoch, esoteric researcher. He's uh, He has the Mystery Teachings show on Gaia TV. So he provides a lot of background information. But um, yeah, Alexandra Holser's involved, uh, Mark Anthony, my, the co-host is from uh, Edge of the Rabbit Hole, Victoria Monday, uh, my, my girlfriend, Nicole, <laughs> Nicole Antoinette, <laughs> who's a psychic medium, get cut some of her perspective in there as well. So um yeah, uh, we, we had a lot of people involved with that. So I was really happy uh, that those people volunteered. And then our, our good friend, um, Coyote Chris Sutton, who passed away yeah. a couple months ago here. Um, so, you know, it's, and it, it it hits me right in the heart anytime I watch uh, episode six now, yeah. because when you see me say goodbye to Chris in that clip, that is the absolute last time I saw him. I, I'm getting a little emotional myself because to yeah. be honest with you, like I was working with Coyote Chris Sutton on a case that's actually related to the Conjuring House. Um, and so it, it all it's all connected. It's it, it's weird how, really how we're all connected, Mike. Yeah, absolutely. And that's well, and that's part of you know my my whole uh, theory with the the connected universe, how you know all of us in our lives are connected. We're connected to everything on this planet. We're connected to the cosmos. It is absolutely all connected. So we actually have a trailer for your docu-series, A Connected Universe. Mm -hmm. we'll, uh, we'll roll that clip. There's a kind of a hallway connecting the bedrooms. Coming down that hall was something, something, I want to say black, but it was more like the absence of vision, something dark. My first thought was there's a fire in the house and I'm going to smell smoke. It was somewhat rolling towards me, but formless, just darkness. It's somebody that erased reality. Thank you. I have to sit down for a minute. <laughs> okay. <sighs> Can you take the camera from me? Yes, yes, certainly. Certainly. What's the matter, Mike? Uh, something over here, I don't know. I just think it's getting darker in here. I woke up in the middle of the night one night and there was this tall, dark figure standing in the corner of my room. What is this? Who are they? I, I tend to think they're from another dimensional space. I call it a gravitational distortion. Oh, pointing right at the hole. It's all right over here. That's right. This yeah. is where the energy is. I think this is kind of an opening to another reality. So you can see all these connections that are interwoven. I have frequently described as a portal cleverly disguised as a farmhouse. That's the bedroom in which I had the experience when I was about eight years old. Amare, Ea, Glasforga. It had red glowing eyes. And that smoke came forth something in my face walking in here. I think something's happening here. So like I got chills watching the <laughs> <laughs> the the um the, the trailer for the shadow dimension docu series and also like looking at it with the idea that we are connected and mm -hmm. all our stories are connected like all the people that are featured in that trailer i know these people and i and so it's weird how we all kind of somehow indirectly have uh started i guess kind of put together somehow yeah you know it, i don't think it's any mistake i don't i don't think it's just luck or randomness that 
you know, we, we've all been connected, you know, with, within this field, our lives coming together, uh, in this aspect, you know, I, you know, I, and I believe in reincarnation past lives and that we've all been connected before. So it's almost, I think in some ways we're almost playing the same story again and again, uh, each time that we, we come into here and into this world and we find each other again. And, uh, you know, I think, along the way, we're learning a little bit more, you know, each time we come around and, you know, we all find each other again. And you know, it's just, it's, it's fascinating, the connections. And so there's something to point out that the story that Carl Johnson talks about the black smoke, mm -hmm. I've actually have had a black smoke experience too, which eventually turned into the man wearing a hat in Salem. And tell us about like, what is black smoke? And is it an early manifestation of what we call shadow people? You know, that's interesting because, um, yeah, some people do report seeing the black smoke and then it manifesting into a, a shadow person, a shadow entity. Um, I've also seen rolling black smoke morph into the apparition of a little girl. And uh, there were five of us that saw that. And I do feature that story as well in the shadow dimension. I have uh, Tom McNicholas, Nick Mulea interviewed them regarding that phenomenon because they were there with me when that happened. And uh, so it's. I think it's a manifestation of of energy of some sort of you know, interdimensional being, whether it morphs into that shadow entity or as an apparition. I, I think you kind of have to wait until it manifests to see. But um, yeah, it's it's really that smoke is really a prelude of things to come. And Mike. <laughs> Also, too, for when it comes to actual, like what you think a shadow person is, and I know we're still figuring this out. Um, I, you know, there's times where I think it's it's something that's interdimensional. There are times that I think it's maybe a disembodied soul that's trying to manifest. What what are your thoughts now about shadow figures, and and what what are they? Yeah, that's kind of the million dollar question. I'll get asked that a lot. Uh, you know, sometimes when I'm doing interviews like this, what you know, one of the first questions that I'll get is, you know what what are these shadow entities and it's like well that that's a whole presentation that i give because they are a lot of different things in fact i'm almost ready to release my course that i have on, on shadow entities which dives into all the different types as well as uh, many other things as well and so yes they can be human spirits they i think a kind of quote unquote true shadow person is an interdimensional being. Uh, they can be extraterrestrials. They could be time travelers. Or maybe we're just getting a glimpse of it. So we'd call it like a time slip. Um, they can be light beings, perhaps astral projections. There, there are a lot of different possibilities to what these things could be. Doppelgangers uh, is, is another one that, you know, and, and when it comes to that, I don't even necessarily believe in the whole, you know, evil twin sort of thing as it is. I think it's almost like another form of time slip where we're actually witnessing ourselves. Sometimes that also comes off as a shadow. So there are all these different possibilities. And you know, I mentioned Mark Anthony earlier, and he has a fantastic quote that I use at the very beginning of, of the shadow dimension, at least a few minutes into it, where he talks about that, you know, these could be, you know, all different types of beings and entities, you know, across the universe, uh, even, you know, from some other dimension, but they're all using a similar energetic modality to come into our world here on earth. And so that energetic modality would be the shadow form. It's like my mind is blown. <laughs> so think, think about the endless possibilities, and also too, like maybe it is something that, uh, like a like a doppelganger or like a um, a time slip. Uh, you know, for me, I I know my experience uh, was the, the beginning of multiple encounters with a man wearing a hat. Uh, so it's almost like this ongoing relationship, and the red glowing eyes to me is uh, significant. Uh, because I do, I've always wondered, like, was it a human or was it something inhuman? And I will say that I never felt, I felt terrified, but I felt like it was feeding off of my fear. So if I do encounter it uh, again, which I haven't actually uh, have experienced it in about a year, uh, but it was commonplace when I, when I worked in Salem, Massachusetts, and it seems to be only in Salem. It's not anywhere else, which is also kind of interesting for me as well. Uh, but I do, I do think that, um, you know, like, it, I do think that it, I go back and forth. Is it inhuman or is it like inter interdimensional or is it a human that's kind of turned into a monster? So I, one of those things right. I, I still, I still debate. 
Yeah, and that and that's a healthy debate to have because we had that exact question on a case. It was over ten years ago now. This is what I first met Carl. <laughs> Um, and on that particular case, it was featured on Animal Planet's The Haunted. The The episode was The Monster in the Closet. And with that particular case, if similar to yours, it had the red glowing eyes. It did not have the hat, but it did have the red glowing eyes. And this thing would consistently appear in the closet of the adult daughter of the house. It would terrorize her, it would terrorize the cat. Other members of the household saw the thing. Um, and you know, we were brought in to investigate that. The show shows us investigating like one time, and then we you know, suddenly called out Carl. But, of course, that's not what really happened. We were out there many, many times over several months investigating this. And that was initially the question. Okay, what exactly are we dealing with here? You know, There was some tragic history to the house. Uh, there was at least one confirmed suicide in the house right in that bedroom. Uh, the original homeowner's father had taken his life there there was another attempted suicide in the house and then there was we could never actually get it confirmed but there was a retired elderly police officer that said that there was a uh a young man who had accidentally asphyxiated himself in the house but we could never confirm that report but still you know tragic history in this house so you know was it possibly one of these people that this entity was and had become you know or was it something inhuman perhaps you know attached to the property that had always been there before the house had built and you know that took a lot of investigating repeatedly going back to the house and we eventually deduced with carl's help that this was actually a demonic presence so yes shadow wow. entities can be demons as well but not as often as people think which is something that uh you know i'll get asked you know are shadow people uh demons and it's like well they can be um you know some of them are but many of them most shadow entities are actually rather benign they're standing there watching observing but that particular one actually was yeah that's one of the things that i, I mean i'm knock on wood i mean i i i i strongly um I'm in a school that that is very, very, very rare, rare for something to be the demonic. Um, right. But I also having worked on those cases and it's a different feel. And so I I know what it feels like. And, and with the situation where I'm dealing with the red, the red glowing eyes, I I know that it, I don't have that feeling, you know, like that, that um, the darkness that you feel when you work on a, on on a demonic case. Yeah, it's totally a, a different feel. And, you know, of all the years that I've been involved in working cases, that was my one single demonic case. You know, there have been other times that we've dealt with some, you know, nasty spirits that were human. They were, you know, a jerk in life, they're a jerk in death, that sort of thing. Right. That was the single demonic case that I was on. So they're few and far between, but it can't happen. Yeah. Now, do you feel like that these darker entities also mimic demons or they take the, the shape of just to scare you off or to, to make you afraid? Uh, you know that I think that can happen, that um, they will try to impersonate a demon, especially if they're, you know, you're, you're getting an EVP or something that says demon. OK, if, if you're actually getting that, it's probably not a demon right. <laughs> or impersonating right. it. You know, a, 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 a demon doesn't you know, necessarily want you to realize and know that it's a demon, you know, they're, they're trying, they're really trying to seduce you and lure you in. So they're not going to reveal themselves immediately like that. So yeah, if you get the D word through an EVP or uh, over your ghost box or whatever, yeah, it's probably not a demon. It's trying to trick you. And, and also it doesn't give you its name either. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> it's like, it's, if it gives yeah. you its name, it's not. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm Dave, the demon. No. <laughs> <laughs> So Mike, so with the with the case that you talked about when it comes to the mineral springs and the and the girl, so the black smoke manifests into a little girl. Tell us a little bit about that story. Yeah, um, that was absolutely fascinating. Um, I, I'd heard the stories of the little girl there before. I'd never really had any interaction with her. She was in, you know, the one room off the hallway up there, and yeah, you know, had gone into the room before. Tried to do a little EV pool. EVP work never really got anything but, but I'd heard the stories from other people about this girl who would hang out by the window usually and she was always you know 
kind of looking for somebody. You know, a lot of people thought that you know perhaps she was waiting for a parent to pick her up, like her father or what have you. Um, more, most of my interest up there in that it's basically the uh, abandoned top floor of that hotel. And the corner suite, we uh, would routinely interact with a woman named Pearl, confirmed suicide from the 1960s. And then further down the hallway, it's an L-shaped hall. And down the one hall, there was a uh, a girl named Molly up there that we'd also interact with a lot. So getting the girl was really surprising. And what had happened was we, I, I ran a, a Paracon out of that hotel for a couple of years. COVID kind of shut that down. But um, at the end of our, our last one, uh, there's just a handful of us left. We're doing a you know investigation after the Paracon and we're up there in Pearl's room, just doing some EVP work. And all of a sudden we start hearing some noises from down the hall. So walk out there, taking a look down both hallways and from the one, all of a sudden the black smoke started coming from the end of the hall and started doing something really interesting as it was coming closer. It was creeping up the wall on the right-hand side of the hall and it would creep back down and creep back up. All the while it's coming closer and closer. And then all of a sudden, one of the times where it creeps up that wall, that's when it formed up into the apparition of the little girl. Like I said, there are five of us that we're there observing this and we're trying to coax her closer and coax her closer. And she actually stopped right at the doorway to that room that she was routinely saw it, seen in. And what's interesting is we all saw her a little bit differently where I saw her like full on from, you know, from the head down to about her knees. And then she started to fade away where others saw her, you know, maybe uh, the, her feet were a you know, more in focus and then she started to fade away at the head and others saw more of the torso. So uh, it was interesting how we all saw her a little bit differently, but we all saw her too. Right. And with that said, with the little girl, so you know that the, the girl has been spotted by multiple people and spotted by multiple people in your group, but do you think that she actually is a, a little girl or maybe she's something else taking the shape of a girl? I think she's a little girl. Okay. Um, I, I've, you know, Coyote Chris, who we talked about earlier, he's one that has seen her up there before, has worked with her, has interacted with her. Um, so he's he's one that is, you know, it, it's a girl. Um, right. My my good friend, uh, psychic medium, Rob Guttrow has been up there. He's also since the presence of the little girl up there. So um, and I, I trust both both those men with my life. So um, but that that's good enough for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, I I have seen entities take the shape of children before, um, mm -hmm. but it's it's as long as you get the validation and the confirmation by multiple psychic mediums, I, I I would go definitely go with them. Yeah, absolutely, and and that can happen where you will have an entity you know try to trick you like that, uh, but it's it's not the case with this little girl. So this is Haunted Hotels with Sam Baltrusa. So we like to talk about other haunted hotels. So what are some other haunted hotels that you have uh, been to? Uh, you know, one of the, an interesting one, you know, before I, you know, became heavily involved in paranormal investigations, it was really um, <laughs> kind of ironic timing because it was just after this happened that I was asked to, uh, I was asked to write the book Ghosts of Maryland. Uh, I was on a business trip out in Salt Lake, St Salt Lake City, staying at the Peary Hotel. And there were multiple pieces of jewelry that were destroyed. So my, and they're both rings. It was a ring that I had and then a co-worker's wedding ring. He was staying in the room uh, above. And so uh, the, the one morning we had each woken up and, you know, my ring had you know stones that had been uh broken chipped out of the actual ring itself where his the the band on it was all bent and distorted and wow. so we went downstairs because you know we're talking we're like what in the world happened you know it kind of clicked almost immediately like was this some sort of spirit or entity that that had done this and so we asked the front desk is this place haunted and they confirmed yeah there it's it's pretty haunted usually it's the um the elevator there that people report uh the hauntings at, at the peary hotel and there's one and I, I can't remember the story just offhand but there's another one of the wings that routinely uh sees an apparition but it was it was just bizarre how uh something there had damaged 
a ring that each of us had put down uh, onto, I think I put mine on the vanity and he had put his on the nightstand, but two different rooms in, you know, the same night. And there you go. I actually had something similar happen not at that hotel, um, but I was at the Captain Grant's Inn in Connecticut and I set up um, like a like a protection ring. So I had something that was made out of like a protection stone and that went missing throughout the night. And also my shoe went missing. And apparently the, the child spirit at the Captain Grant's Inn hides things like she will, she'll take them and she'll put them in a closet. And so I, I ended up like leaving the inn without my shoe. <laughs> and <laughs> the, the owner, uh, Ted, he was like, Sam, Sam, like, I found your shoe. And I'm like, where, you know, where was it? He was like, oh, it was in a closet. And I'm like, and I'm like, apparently the spirit likes to do that. So that it, like, like, do you, do you know like what would like cause, what, would it, was it someone, something tied to ring specifically at the hotel in uh, Salt Lake? Well, that's something I would love to go back and research. I've not been back to Salt Lake City since then. Um, you know, my initial gut feeling is is that it was a woman um, yeah. who was apparently upset and distraught. Not really sure why, uh, but that is something I'd love to go back and and research more on. But that's oh my gosh, that was fifteen years ago now. <laughs> it's hard to believe that. <laughs> And those are like those kinds of things that um, you like the skills that I have now versus say the skills that 15 years ago are two different things. And it's interesting oh, yeah. how we kind of, how you and I have evolved over the years to where we are now. Oh, absolutely. Because, yeah, like I said, I hadn't been heavily involved with investigating at that point. And my very first paranormal investigation was like around 1989, 1990, somewhere around there. So I had, you know, done that i've been involved some way shape or form during that time a lot of you know research and just kind of reading and interacting with people on different forums and you know things like that um you know had you know played around with evp a little bit and so this was like just on the cusp of like i said i, I just after that I was commissioned to to write ghosts of maryland and that's when i really started getting heavily involved and so yeah i was still pretty green back then yeah so, Mike, you also have been sort of like the go-to person when it comes to Alaska. And tell us about your whole backstory uh, in Alaska and sort of the different programs that you've worked on. Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, I just released the book, Alaska's Mysterious Triangle. And uh, that was really inspired by being involved with the show, The Alaska Triangle, which is running right now on uh, the Travel Channel, streaming on Discovery Plus. The uh, season finale for season two is this coming Friday. So, um, yeah, they had reached out to me and contacted me actually about uh, a video that I had put out there about uh, investigating portal activity. And when we had the interview about that they started asking me what i might know about alaska and so i immediately jumped to the alaska triangle because i'd been stationed up there for three years back in the early to mid 90s uh, 1992 1995 and you know, i'd heard about a lot of the legends and lore while i was up there and so it just immediately clicked um okay we're gonna get this guy involved with the show but um but yeah i had those now again it was you know very uh you know early i'd had you know, the little investigation and, you know, I was interested in, you know, all things paranormal. I had experiences when I was younger. Uh, you want to talk about green, <laughs> you know, I was, a, I was a young airman and, um, in Alaska, um, oof, it, I mean, you can get lonely up there. Uh, I was 4,000 miles from home, very homesick. I was 18 years old. Yeah. Um, and they'll tell you that, uh, you know, you'll either, while you're up there, you'll either get married, have children, get divorced, or do all three. And I did two of the three while I was up there. <laughs> um, got married and started having kids at that young of an age. Um, so my focus wasn't on things paranormal, but things happened. You know, I was, um, so two of the three years that I was up there, I was in the, uh, basically the basement of the command building, the, the Alcom Alaskan command building working in, it was a, uh, it was a division called WMCCS, W M C C S uh, worldwide command uh, control systems, which later turned to global command control systems. So basically I'm a computer guy, but being in that basement, we saw all kinds of strange things down there. A lot, a lot of shadow activity uh, within 
that complex. So we would see, we would see some over by the server racks and all that. Most of it would happen in the back office area, which had a really, really creepy vibe to it. And we'd kind of whisper about it and talk about it. There, there were legends that the building had once been a hospital and that we were actually uh, stationed in the morgue and that where we had our, our server racks and the patch panels and all that was where the coolers had been, which the, that story was a fabrication. Um, I did the research on the building. It's only ever been a command building, but you know, was it one of those, okay, you know, people have been experiencing this activity for a long time down here. Is this the only reasonable explanation they could come up with for it? Because yeah, we would get creeped out down there. And, um, I remember in 1995, summer of 95, uh, my mother and sister came up to visit and I gave them kind of the nickel and dime tour, you know, got them a visitor's pass and uh, they went walking through there. My mom got totally creeped out down there. And I, I did not tell her anything about the shadow entities that we'd seen down there or anything like that, but she was immediately creeped out down there. So th there's definitely something going on. Now, like with, when it comes to Alaska, there's also, they have a few hotels, mainly because it's just, mm -hmm. Alaska's just kind of creepy, kind of like Maine. Maine's creepy too. Um, like, have you been to any haunted hotels in Alaska? Um, yeah, I, ha I have been. Now, since I was stationed up there, I wasn't really hanging out at a lot of hotels, but right. um, yeah, when I was up there for filming, you know, I, I was walking around, uh, downtown Anchorage and they have the historic Anchorage hotel, which actually was just featured on a, a recent episode here of the television show. They didn't film that for season one. They did for season two. Um, and that building, you know, has some, it's one of the oldest uh, buildings in downtown Anchorage. A, a lot of buildings were um, uh, heavily damaged or destroyed by the uh, earthquake in the 1960s, which was uh, the largest, uh, earthquake on record for North America, second largest in the world that we have on record. And uh, a lot of strange history. So you know, there was a uh, police officer who was found dead, shot with his own gun right outside the hotel. Uh, they routinely see a woman there. Sometimes they see her uh, as a shadow. Sometimes they see her as an apparition. But uh, one of those where she had committed suicide because her, uh, you, you hear this story a lot in Alaska. Uh, at some of these different hotels where a you know woman is staying there at the hotel because her boyfriend or husband or fiance or whomever has gone off to the gold rush and they're gone either for so long or or whatever the story is and uh, in the meantime you know the woman is murdered or she commits suicide this one committed suicide uh, and there, there's also a little ghost boy in that hotel as well uh, and that's one there's uh, the captain cook hotel downtown anchorage there's a woman in white that's seen primarily over on the bathroom area, which is kind of strange, but that's where she's seen. Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of interesting stories that they're uh, surrounding hotels. Mike, I mean, obviously people have to watch, should watch the, the series to, to get your, your take, but what do you, like, kind of like the, um, the, the shortened version of like what you think is going on there. Like why is the Alaska, the triangle so, uh, so haunted? So, so, uh, so, so many weird things happening there. Well, you have a lot of energy up there. So this is one of those, uh, you know, vortex areas of the world. Kind of like, you know, we always think of the Bermuda Triangle. There's a lot of those type of areas around the world. So there's Bermuda, Alaska. There's the Dragon Triangle uh, off of Japan's coast. Uh, Bridgewater Triangle there in uh, in New England, in, in Massachusetts. Uh, there's Lake Michigan Triangle. So there's all these different areas of the world that have these strange disappearances, enhanced supernatural activity, lots of UFO sightings, all of these different things. And Alaska is one of those. Uh, with that particular location, it's you know, it's a very volatile area. Uh, you, you have these massive earthquakes like we were just talking about up there. There's volcanic activity. I mean, when I stepped off the airplane in 1992, there's still ash falling from the sky from a recent volcanic eruption. Right. Um, and then also up there, you have you know, we, we love seeing the Aurora Borealis, but forget, you know, why that's caused. And it's basically, you know, the electrons and protons coming from these uh, solar flares from the sun and they're smashing against the ionosphere up there. But the magnetic protection there for the earth is thinner. So you're getting a lot more of that, uh, of the activity from the sun 
affecting the area as well. So you have all these energies up there in Alaska that are helping to manifest uh, this activity. And when it comes to the hotels, since we're doing haunted hotels, it would, it's a very transient area there, especially a hundred years ago when you had things like uh, the, the different gold rushes that were going on the Klondike. And, uh, you know, Alaska was seen as a gateway for that because the Klondike was, you know, hard to access via land. What they would do is they would take boats along the coast and then they'd uh, get off on these coastal towns in Alaska and trek, uh, you know, northeastward into Canada, which is where the Klondike were, was to, uh, to get this gold. Uh, so you would have, you know, all kinds of crazy maritime wrecks up there. The, uh, the hotels were, I mean, it was like the wild west just in Alaska. You know, you had, you know, these, these brothels and things like that, uh, at these hotels and these people constantly in and out, in and out, in and out. Uh, so you have a lot of that transient energy as well. I'm also like, you know, I, my grandfather and my father would go a lot. And I've actually have never been to Alaska and I always wanted to go, but I'm also getting that, that it maybe like, like sort of like geodynamic. So you talked about the volcanoes and mm -hmm. all that, but even the, like what, what kind of, is it, is there any, like uh, any stone or uh, anything in the ground that would per, uh, sort of amplify the hauntings? Yeah. The, um, I'd have to look up the specific stone that's in the ground, but um, you know, I did some research on the, um, uh, U.S. Geological uh, Association or whatever the exact uh, association is called, but they have these fantastic uh, um, research papers that they've done on the magnetic activity in the area. And they've actually mapped out these different zones that have the uh, different levels of magnetism. So this is something that is, you know, known in the scientific community that, you know, there are these uh, areas that are, even more highly amplified. And that's why you see things like harp, you know, built up there in Alaska. It's, it's harnessing some of that energy that's already there. So, right. um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely uh, geological. And so Mike, if you could stay at a, a room with a boot anywhere in the world, where would you stay? Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, well, I mean, bucket list item is the Stanley. Right. You know, so, yeah, I still have not yet been there, but that is definitely on my list. Yeah, the Stanley actually has. So a lot of people, there's a lot of misconceptions associated with the Stanley. And I, uh, my little brother lives uh, in Denver. And so I, I went to visit. And to me, the, the hauntings there are are happy hauntings. So uh, and also to like get, speaking of the, the, the geodynamics, like the, the if there's a lot of limestone and a lot of uh, stone yeah. beneath the the Stanley that I feel like kind of it sort of like captures the the residual hauntings uh so it almost it almost preserves the hauntings there so I think it's mainly residual in nature and a lot of it's positive and not negative uh yeah you know that's and that's one of the things that I've heard as well I, I put together a couple of years ago a video on the Stanley even though I've never been there but um it was when it was when Dr. Sleep was was coming out so I wanted to yeah, you know, naturally, I want to piggyback on that. So I did a YouTube video. Uh, but one of the tour guides there at the Stanley had reached out to me and said, you know, you actually you know, were really, really accurate with the way that you portrayed the hauntings here, which is great. And I heard I've heard a lot about the, um, you know, the basement there and oh. and, and the stone. Um, you know, we talked about Mark Anthony earlier and he was down there talking to me about you know, some green lights and mist and things that they had seen down there in the basement area associated with the stone. Yeah, like you're you're actually able to go through, and you can see like where the I, I'm assuming it's limestone, but it's some kind of stone or um, or quartz that you can see when you go through. And there's there's no doubt in my mind that that's what's going on paranormally. Right, right, yeah. And like I said, I want to get up there one of these days, just experience that for myself. So. Right. I mean, that would be Mike. That would be a fun trip, like a, like having all like like a group of paranormal researchers like ourselves just kind of go out, going out to see like what 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 makes the Stanley really haunted. Oh yeah, that'd be great. I'd I'd love to do something like that. It'd be, you know, for one, it'd just be fun. Right. It'd be fun. <laughs> but, but yeah, um, to, to be able to research that out and try to figure it out, I'd love it. So, Mike, also too, like you you have you mentioned uh, Men in Black, and I. I have uh, actually had something happen recently, and I want to give too much away. Uh, involving Men in Black, tell, tell our our listeners what exactly Men in Black are. Yeah, Men in Black. So, um, primarily, a lot of people believe 
that well and I spent some time working at NSA. And so there, there's a little inside joke that I was once a man in black. Because there were times that I'd have to dress up in, in a dark suit and go off site somewhere. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, a, lo- a lot of times they are, they're, they're a shadowy government organization that, you know, when you have some of these different UFO sightings, suddenly they, they show up and they're either, you know, trying to put the kibosh on the rumor mill or uh, interrogate somebody uh, on what they saw and try to, you know, spin the story that, that they want told. Um, interesting story though, that, that I've been telling here over the last uh, few years regards Albert K. Bender, who founded the International Flying Saucer Bureau back in 1952. Now, by 1953, he had blown this organization up internationally. It was in the UK, it was in Australia. Uh, They had a, a newsletter that was going out all the time. And then all of a sudden, boom, he just stopped it. You think, you know, 1952, 1953, there's, there's no internet. Long distance calls are very expensive. But yet, even though he had blown this thing up huge, he just immediately stopped it. So what happened? And a lot of people thought that the men in black had gotten to him. There were those rumors going around. He was very, very cryptic. It wouldn't really tell anybody what had happened until the early 60s. Finally released a book telling what had happened. And his story was that, He was in his room one night and all of a sudden these three dark shadowy hat wearing entities materialized through his wall. They had their red glowing eyes. Well, actually they were white glowing eyes. I'm sorry. They were white glowing eyes. That's important. Um, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, I don't want to get the story wrong. Um, They materialized into his room and uh, they, they told him you have to, you have to stop your research on, on the UFOs. And so I hear the story in from a paranormal inspectors, in, in, or a paranormal investigator's viewpoint, I'm like, this is a, sh- a shadow person story. Right. Albert K. Bender believed that they were extraterrestrials, that they were warning him and they had, you know, threatened him, uh, you know, off of his research, that they were actually harvesting resources down in Antarctica. And, and he stated that, you know, when they were done with their mission and had left the planet, then he was allowed to talk about it. Other people hear the story and they're like, well, these are the men in black because they they would follow him around too. Uh, he, they showed up elsewhere, not just at his house later on. So it's interesting how uh, it, it's almost like through, you know, a different lens. He's kind of just the lens a little bit and it's the same story, but you kind of get three different perspectives on the same thing. So were they the men in black? Were they extraterrestrials? Were they shadow entities? Now, jury's still kind of out. Yeah, so my, my mind's kind of blown with this discussion because truthfully, like the, the men in black idea, if you look at what's been stalking me in Salem, uh, it could possibly be a man a, a men in black scenario. Hey, that's always possible. I mean, you do have the glowing eyes. You have the hat. Yeah. Um, he's been following you around a lot. So, yeah, that there is that possibility. So I will say this. Um, uh I mentioned Darcy Weir earlier. His documentary, uh, Who Saw the Men in Black, is coming out here in December. So uh, check that out. I'm in it. <laughs> also, uh, Richard Dolan, Rick Doty, and uh, several others. So it's going to be fascinating because uh, they kind of they kind of really get into the um, you know secret government agency part of it. But we do talk about like the Albert K. Bender story and, and, and those sorts of things as well. And so, Mike, so since you kind of you specialize in sort of all, all these different um, sort of like dis, uh, areas of the paranormal, uh, what what do you think? I mean, like, what do, do you think that that uh, men in black are um, possibly shadow people? Like, what do you think that they are? You know, I think they can be they can be each. Now, I, I do think that there are certainly secret shadowy government agencies that are out there and they have their agents and yes they do dress in black i i mean i've seen them okay. <laughs> you know, i wasn't i won't say that i was one myself um <laughs> because that was just I, I mean basically i was dressing i had to go i mean we're going to off-site secret locations that are hidden in plain sight so we couldn't dress up in our military uniform so they wanted right. us to dress civilian um but yeah those guys exist um and they want people to keep quiet about certain things that they've seen. So those guys definitely exist. When it comes to things that are a little bit more supernatural in nature, um, you know, there's there's almost this gray area between, okay, what's really 
you know, a, what we would call a, a shadow entity and an extraterrestrial. Cause I think that sometimes they can be the same thing that, you know, especially if it's something that's traveling interdimensionally, and this is just the way that they're, they're coming off to our eyes. Um, I think that a shadow person could certainly be a, uh, an extraterrestrial as well. So if we're looking at this thing, you know, with the hat, with the glowing eyes and all that, it's okay. It's, it's shadowy, but it could also be that ET as well. So I worked on a project and I can't give too much away about the project, Mike, but I will say that I had an experience with what I believe is like a triangular like shape uh, aircraft. Uh, and it was flying right above us. I also saw what looked like um, kind of like a, like a like sort of like a force field uh, and something came through like like a like a portal like a like a doorway something coming through and this thing hat was a man in black wearing a hat um and i'm you know i'm giving away sort of like what i experienced that for this project that i was working on but based on like the, that description mike like does that has are there other stories out there that are similar yeah, you'll get you'll get some stories like that where you know the the entity that shows up that almost sounds like an ET experience, but you know the entity that shows up happens to be you know the the hat wearing uh, individual, and so um, yeah, but it, it also you also have to ask yourself, okay, what is this craft that that I'm looking at? You know, is this? I mean, there's also the idea that a lot of these things that we're seeing and witnessing are actually ourselves from another point in time. You know, is, right is would that craft possibly be a a time machine and you're actually seeing somebody from the future you know there's that on the table too yeah it was one of the situations where it, it was almost like too perfect to be i'm like 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 the like like the universe set it up or something and uh, it happened and i'm like I, i'm terrified of of ets and um the idea of experiencing ets and of course i'm going to of course see them you know <laughs> when, when i'm out <laughs> in the field but and right. i and i want to i want to believe that that what i was experiencing was paranormal like it was an entity as opposed to um an extraterrestrial because i can handle that yeah <sighs> But they're all related. We talked earlier know, about everything yeah. being connected. So, I know. They're, so it's they're, a connected, they're all connected. paranormal yeah. universe too. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, so Mike, what's what's next for you? You mentioned the documentary. Um, and I, I, I will say like when you did the docu-series, I think you're on to something with that. I mean, are you doing more of this, the docu-series in the future? I am. Yeah, I started filming uh, part two this year. So um, I, I can tell you that will feature some footage from the Hinsdale house. It will also feature some footage from Egypt. So when I was out in Egypt earlier this year, I was doing some filming for season two. So uh, still in the very, very early stages of, of getting all that material together, but there will be a season two. I cannot tell you when it's going to be released. Um, I have a lot going on behind the scenes with uh, the Connected Universe portal. So um, I have more courses that are going to be live and going up there uh, in the future. One of those, the long-awaited Shadow Entities course, but uh, but that is coming. But the the Egypt uh, course is up there right now, uh, so people can dive into that. And so, Mike, speaking of Egypt, in, in your book, you do kind of go into different cultures and sort of the experience mm -hmm. of shadow people. Like, for, like tell us a, a little bit about uh, Egypt's backstory with shadow entities. Yeah, you know, shadow entities have been with us, you know, throughout all of our, our world history. Uh, they were reported there in ancient Sumer. When I mentioned them in ancient Egypt, it's from the perspective of the ancient Egyptians believing in seven different parts of the soul. And one of those was the kabit or the shadow. And so uh, basically what they believed in was that, you know, there were uh, five different, they had seven different parts of the soul. Five of them would go off to the constellation of Orion uh, at death. Two parts of the soul, however, the Ka, which was the animating part of the soul, and the shadow, the Kabit, would stay here on Earth to, to roam around. The Ka would eventually uh, go off, but the Kabit, the shadow, would still be lurking around here. And there's uh, you know, some interesting, uh, there's an interesting freeze at the uh, tomb of Renifer at the Theban Necropolis, where you actually see uh, the, the picture of the shadow standing there in front of the tomb, basically you know 
I'm here. I'm staying, you know, by the tomb and on earth while you see the Bob birds taking off, taking flight uh, to Orion. So uh, it's very fascinating. That just gave me the chills, Mike, because because I've actually so looking at the idea of sort of like splinter uh, shadow parts of, of uh, spirits. So some of the things that I've encountered, uh, for example, the Lizzie Borden bed and breakfast in Fall River, um, I believe what's there, it's not my distant cousin, Lizzie Borden. It's a sort of a splinter self. And mm-hmm. and have you experienced that sort of like splinter, um, split the parts of, of different people? So maybe the, the, the core of them passed on to the fifth dimension or to heaven, but the shadow uh, aspect is still lingering at the location. Yeah, it's like a piece of them. It's like a shadow of their former selves. Yeah. Uh, unintended. <laughs> but, right. you know, you mentioned when we had you on Edge of the Rabbit Hole, uh, you know, we started talking about you know, the possibility of, uh, you know, what was there beforehand, the Native Americans. I, you know, I asked you that, you know, what had been there, you know, beforehand. Um, and the Native Americans, they had a lot of different legends, depending on the tribe. Uh, but many of them also believed in multiple parts of the soul. Um, you know, the one that I always use for an example is the Choctaw, you know, because they, they believed in two different shadows. One would go on to the land of the ghost while the other would stay here on earth to roam around. So, you know, you see some similar different ideas in cultures that were here in America, uh, you know, not, not way out there in Egypt, but right here in America. So we see that here too. Yeah. And again, like when I talk to you, my, my mind always like it, it expands and it, and it blow, it's like mind blown um, because that's kind of I'm I'm going in that direction, too, as a paranormal researcher. But you have that sort of the Egyptian backstory um, and the, the idea that this is not new. It's something that's been around for thousands of years. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we have to call into question, okay, thousands of years, but how many thousands of years? Because there's, you know, big debate right now as to the actual age of of Egypt and, and our other lands. You know, how old is the Sphinx? How old really are the pyramids? Are there lost civilizations that had, you know, grown up and you know, had been obliterated by ancient cataclysms and then civilization had to restart and reform again? So how long really has this been going on? In my Alaska book, I draw some of those um some of those connections between, you know, Alaska, Antarctica, and Atlantis. So, you know, how much of this is, how much of this goes back to the time of Atlantis? And, you know, we're, you know, we using stargates and portals back then. And, you know, are some of these entities that we're observing and witnessing, did they travel to our planet through some of these stargates and portals that maybe the ancient Atlanteans had. And then when that cataclysm had that wiped out those civilizations, did some of them linger here afterward or still with us today and can't get home? Yeah. And like that, so I think I see that this is the direction that I'm going with my, my research as well. I, I, I find it. So hopefully we'll, you and I will have more conversations about this, but before Hope I let so. you go with Mike, I, I always enjoy our conversations. We talk about thought forms and tulpas and anything like any, um, what are your thoughts on, on, on a thought form? And for people don't know what a thought form is, like what exactly is a thought form? Yeah. So this is a, uh, this is an ancient uh, far Eastern uh, belief about uh, creating a sentient being from your thoughts. And uh, so that's, you know, the thought form is, is just that. Um, so we see this in our, you know, mo- more modern culture. People think of Slender Man. Um, we, we know that the idea of Slender Man was uh, created on an online forum for a Photoshop contest. Uh, so we know it's, it's, origins but over time as more and more people kept feeding into the story and giving it life a lot of people believe that you know there is a real slender man entity out there that has been formed up of all these people putting their their energy into it Uh, where i've seen that in regards to uh, specifically shadows um i first read about this actually in the mothman prophecies and people i think kind of glaze over the story because it's right at the beginning of the book and has nothing to do with the mothman but john keeler related the story of walter b gibson who under the uh, pen name maxwell grant had written the stories of the shadow from you know the old 1930s pulp fiction character who became the radio show you know the shadow knows um that guy and in his old house in greenwich village in new york um he wrote you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stories about the shadow and after he moved out people started seeing a 
shadow entity there in his house. And for a long time, they, they never they didn't relate it to you know, his writing there, they kept thinking things like, oh, maybe it's a spirit of a revolutionary war soldier or something like this. But they would see the shadow with the hat in the hallway and other parts of the house. And finally, uh, you know, Walter B. Gibson and also John Keel kind of came forward and said, no, that's not what that is. That is actually uh, Gibson's thoughts, you know, basically manifesting there in the house because he had put put forth so much energy into the world on this character that it just, it, it was basically born right there in the house and it's still there. Yeah. My, my mind again, we, I think we, we always end up talking about this, but I, I had, I was working on a book on, I lived in Manhattan for, for many years. Um, and that story always has always really intrigued me to the point where I actually would hang out. It was, it's called gay street. It's the name of the street. Yeah. And I would, I would actually hang out on the street, like, like looking at the house, waiting for something to happen, like someone to run out, I guess, or to see the shadow, which I never did. But I, do, but I do think that that's a perfect example of, of a thought form in modern times. Yeah, it really is. And it, it has so many interesting connections to our, to our popular culture. And people are familiar with the shadow story. They're familiar with, uh, you know, who, you know, the pen name Maxwell Grant. Um, and then of course, you know, Keel writing about in the Mothman prophecies, you know, people are familiar with Mothman. Um, you know, even though, again, the story had nothing to do with the Mothman, you know, it's right there in a, in a very famous book in our circles. And so, yeah, people are able to instantly relate to it. And then, you know, uh, Hans Holzer investigated there. So you throw that name out there too. And people are, oh, okay, you know, I, I understand what this is. So Mike, it's been amazing chatting with you again. Uh, so for people to reach out to you, what's your website? Yeah, people can find me, MikeRicksecker.com. You can find uh, all my books out there, latest projects. Uh, you can also go to ConnectedUniversePortal.com. That's my online learning platform. So I have a lot more information out there as well. Courses, articles, um, you know, hours and hours and hours, hundreds of hours worth of video out there as well. So uh, yeah, check that out too. And, and also for the docu series, for those who are not able to watch it on Amazon, uh, it's now on Tubi. Uh, and uh, you can type in uh, the shadow dimension. Is that how they, they get access to it on Tubi? Uh, yeah, you can just uh, type in shadow dimension on TubiTV.com or if you have the app or it's on your smart TV. Uh, you can also go to shadowdimension.com and I have the link right there to it. Awesome. Well, Mike Ricksecker, it was a pleasure chatting with you. And thanks for checking in with Haunted Hotels with Sam Baltrusis. Thanks again, Sam. Appreciate it. Thank you.